Lord, these are strange days When science and God play Around with the old ways And I can't keep them Of course, each of you will receive one of these <laughs> as a part of your participation in the project. <laughs> this way I will not lose you in the forest. <laughs> My name is Dr. Jennifer Willett. I'm a professor in the School of Visual Arts at the University of Windsor. I am director of Incubator Hybrid Laboratory at the intersection of art, science, and ecology. And I'm the director of BioArt Camp. I've invited 20 artists, scientists, and students to join me here in the Rocky Mountains at the Banff Center for the Arts and at Castle Mountain Hostel, where we will be building a portable bio art laboratory in the forest. To the river and the pines It was amazing! Amazing! <laughs> I'm interested in allowing the general public as well as artists and scientists and students and you, the viewer of this video, the opportunity to see that the laboratory is in fact teeming with life. That when we manipulate life in the lab, we are in turn manipulating ourselves and our ecology. The goal of this project is to transport the laboratory ecology from within the institution, outside, into an ecological environment. The idea behind this type of work comes from many years of me working in laboratory spaces and seeing that the lab itself is an ecology in a way that is not often represented in popular media. When we shut this down for the night, when we're in the we need to remember to charge the drill battery. Let's, uh, let's spark this place up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because the fluorescent raccoon here told me what I needed to know, that while all the others that were doing similar kind of things with DNA and trying to find things on the genome, they were trying to amplify the signal. They kept trying to figure out how to make DNA glow more brightly and like better, making better radioactive probes and all these things. But what Mullis realized was that via the fluorescent raccoon was that what you really needed to do was to make more sample. Not more signal, but more sample. Uh, so then, rather than try to amplify that signal, he amplified the sample by billions of times. I got a half jug agar, no old PCR machine. Here in Banff, they have these hot springs, these natural thermal springs. And the sort of primary interesting player in the PCR process is a special type of bacteria called Thermus aquaticus. Once I have those, I'm going to try to perform PCR, uh, not in a lab, not in a very specialized machine, uh, as most labs would, but I'm actually going to try to perform this uh, over the campfire, moving uh, in cycles between different uh, pots of hot water on these uh, campfires, each which is held in a, at an exact uh, degree Celsius, 95, 65 uh, and 60 degrees Celsius. The project that I'm really interested in working on now here at, at BioArt Camp is to really rethink our relationship to different types of scientific instruments in the lab. And in particular, what I'm working with is the incubator. And the incubator is a fundamental instrument in the lab. It's used to, to grow uh, agar plates, uh, different types of uh, bacterial culture, for example. And the aim of the incubator is also to remain sterile. You don't want any contamination in the incubator. And you want to be able to isolate different types of bacterial strains. 
And what I'm interested in is kind of polluting that relationship and bringing in the human, uh, having a relationship with different types of bacteria, fungus, uh, viruses, and trying to think about a relationship across scales. So across the human dimension to this microscopic world that we coexist with every day. I want to be able to create an incubator that biodegrades in, into the environment and actually contaminates the, um, the, the soil and um, melts into the, the earth and actually feeds microbes. So instead of using an incubator to remove any kind of contamination or microbial life, I want to make more life, more microbial life um, by feeding it. And uh, I should, uh, I forgot to bring my uh, compass. I was going to give my location. But we'll say back camp. Oh, you know, yeah. Thank you. Just put it in the microscopy box. Okay. <laughs> Go sample. <laughs> Number one. Again, I guess what's happening here in the woods is sort of this notion of towards a deep woods PCR or towards a kind of, uh, you know, uh, back to nature uh, DNA amplification, one that might have been able to be done in sort of uh, almost Stone Age times. We're using Tetrahymena thermophilia. So these are the organisms I brought here, and uh, I'm going to look at them. I'm going to try to get them to mate. I'm going to try to get the, the different genders to conjugate. And I hope that this... Uh, well, this viewing, this sort of voyeurism, looking at these organisms that have seven genders will provoke people to discuss our ideas of gender, our ideas of sex, how do we define sex, how do we define species, and how do we define biologically and socially our ideas of gender, how, how much can we go uh, further in, in analyzing ourselves through uh, viewing another organism that's so alien to us. Yesterday the tetrahymena arrived in a little uh, in little flasks and I divided them into bunches. So I, first I want people to see them separately and try to describe them uh, as, as much as or as wildly as they can. I want them to stop thinking about female and, and, and male and, and, um, and think of uh, describing gender in different ways. Collecting some, what I suspect are mature juniper berries. You know, Banff, the mountains, the Rockies, the wilderness is, you know, usually this understood as a site of exploration. I'm going to excavate the doll. Are you loud? There you go. Kind of. This morning we were driving between here and Johnson's Canyon, which is maybe seven minutes from here, and we saw a baby bear cub on the side of the road. It's a black bear cub. With a cub comes a mother, an angry, protective mother. Um, I'm not really sure, but Kurt and Angus both uh, said that it could be a deer. Um, it's pretty interesting to see how clean it is. There's no meat or anything attached to it. What I'm planning to do here is, um, is work with a biological specimen, which is my wife, <laughs> and partner and muse. And we're going to, just because I look at the whole world as basically information, I want to uh, introduce a kind of curious aspect of working in nature. Scenes with the mannequin that I brought, this life-size mannequin. I've, I've brought the mannequin back to where they came from, which is wood. Oh and I want the mannequin to experience the woods. And then there's a number of projects with Louise. So it's a live person and the mannequin and the woods and wildness and the daisies. Do the daisies with me. Do the daisies. Good stuff. OK, cool. Then <laughs> raw. So these little guys here are caterpillars, which eventually are going to turn into the Rocky Mountain Apollo butterfly. And here at BioArt Camp, I'm going to be working on a project where I'm looking at what these guys like to eat. The butterflies are threatened by rising tree line, 
So trees are advancing into the meadows where they live and giving them less and less space uh, for what they need to do. And as it turns out, as trees are advancing into the meadow, the plants that they need to eat are also being affected by these trees that are moving into their meadows. So what I'm hoping to do here at BioArt Camp is do a series of tests to determine uh, what these caterpillars like to eat and how they like to eat and how that fits into this broader framework of trees rising in the Rocky Mountains and beyond, and hopefully it'll be applicable not only here, but to butterfly systems uh, elsewhere in the world. So what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to make a little caterpillar harness. Okay. And I'm gonna actually, <laughs> no. it's, it's made out of, it's a hair from Louise's wig. Lord, these are strange days When science and God play Around with the old way And I can't keep them straight What I planned to do was to detect hydrogen sulfide, a toxic gas, uh, which is an industrial pollutant, especially important in the petroleum uh, industry in uh, Alberta. Natural gas, uh, some types of natural gas contain hydrogen sulfide, which is also called sour gas. And uh, pumping stations in pristine areas like what we have our bio art camp uh, uh, the farmers and the people that live near there complain about the sour gas uh, affecting their health, the health of their animals. So it's sucking the air from the environment that's bubbling through the solution and tomorrow we will sample that to see if there's any hydrogen sulfide accumulated. And I want to make sure it's bubbling properly, yep. <laughs> You kneel to your samples. I am so hot. So now I'm trying to figure out how the BioArt camp itself could be considered as an architectural practice. This idea of bringing the lab outside, the opening up of a kind of sterile and closed environment to kind of a space of indeterminacy. Maybe this is a living process. Maybe we don't even have to consider the living components there. Maybe the only fact of doing that is uh, especially uh, performing a kind of quality of life. Or we can strip a cell down to nothingness and then kind of rebuild DNA synthetically yeah. and, and insert it. And thus, DNA becomes now the sort of central unit of investigation. I mean, I'm, I'm critical of this kind of essentialization. Uh, you know, I'm, criti I'm critical of the kind of uh, this sort of genetic determinism that comes with uh, this kind of um, strongly kind of DNA-centric science. We may have left you know, the, the, what, what we formally de de described as, as biology, right? We may be in a different, not that biology doesn't still exist, but, but the current era of techno, of big science is not biology, I think it's post-biology. Yeah. It's not just a metaphor for you. Oh, it, it, it is a metaphor. You know, because of the pervasiveness and the importance of our environmental problems in the world, which are being articulated, you know, the receding Arctic and you know, deserts and changing and heat and weather and everything like what, like that's all really impacting on a lot of us. So it's all about kind of environmental sits so on. So maybe it's all going to weave itself together into those things. And I, th I, I hope BioArt adds its voice to that whole structure. Uh, people are coming to this BioArt camp with many different projects and I have yet to fully understand everyone's project. But I think what Jennifer's trying to do in a way is um, expose a public to um, how artists are asking questions about biotechnology, which is very different than, than how scientists would do that. I'm also really interested in a social and political analysis of technology. And I'm fearful that as a culture, we are together blindly follow, falling into a, a future that is not being determined for our best needs or for our ecology's best needs, but instead for the economy's best needs and the best needs of businessmen. So with a project like this, I'm driven primarily first by the images it will create, because that is my nature. Secondary to that, I'm driven by the social and political economy of the arguments that we are making with those images. All around with the old 
And I can't keep them straight She sung like a bird song And she loved me all day long But they say I done way wrong Across certain lines Whitish and blackish Sharp edge, strong bay I've been a bad man I know